Hello? Okay. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, are we having a break because uh, some people do move now? No, okay, I should just continue. Um, well, let me just continue by inviting also the other panelists um, who are Kirsten Maas. Please, can you join us? And I will introduce them once they're here. Uh, Vera, Franz, and Robert, are you, where are you? Okay, great. But these are our panelists for the second part of this session. Hello. Hi. Just feel free where to have a seat. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the occasion to meet two other people. I would like to call Tamar Gurciani from Georgia and Ahmed Asari from Yemen. Can you please also join us? Oh, great. Ah, I saw you, but I didn't know you were Ahmed. <laughs> Tamar? Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hi. So, sorry. Hey. <clears throat> Great, but first things first, I have a very strict time limit here. Um, I think my iPhone died. Can someone? Okay. Great. So, um, let's talk about money. <laughs> exactly. Um, this session is about, or the title of the session is The Economy of Activism. And I think I don't have to use, to spend a many words to um, let you know that we sooner or later all face the issue of money with respect to activism. Although I have some leading questions here we will address today. And um, so this session is, the, the description of this session is actually to find out the different ways of financing activism, the limits of activism, the, in terms also of credibility and moral acceptability when it comes to sponsorship, private and public sector cooperations. Our guiding questions today is how do activists deal with the need to stay independent but also raise money? What funding opportunities are there for activists who are not organized in NGOs or other forms of formal structures? What trends and current developments are there in the nonprofit fundraising sector? How can you be an activist if there are no funding opportunities? What are the challenges or dangers in accepting international funding for, lo for local ac action? And I think this more or less um, concerns maybe to the financial transfer from the west to the east or maybe from the global north to the global south, I would say. Um, maybe one of the last questions would be also how can crowdfunding be used? So we have a lot of questions. And I'm sure um, it's impossible to address all these questions and to hear the opinion of all our panelists with respect to these questions. I would say that um, I would also start with a brief introduction, introductory questions. Uh, in my first part, I would um, like to ask the activists what their experience with um, financing activism is. So you have here the questions. Um, I'm sure you would like to say some general things, but if you would like to, I can also ask you specific questions. But I think we have enough questions on the table and it's up to you to t pick up a couple of questions or one or two questions who are important for you and try to give an answer on that. Who would like to start? Oh, 
I'm so sorry. I it was not on my script here. So sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Welcome. Sorry in the name of the panel. <laughs> um, I assume you also hear the questions. Yeah. Um, maybe we can start here. Hi, guys. My name is Ahmed Asiri. I'm an artist uh, activist. I come from Yemen. Uh, we are travelers. We travel and meet artists and activists around the world. And seriously, uh, economy makes a big role in shaping first the, 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 uh, the inside feeling, the inside feeling of I am good and I can do. So it's very important that an activist answers and be honest from the beginning with himself and knowing the scope, the, the, the longer plan and expecting, trying to expect what's going to happen along the way. And also vision and uh, education is very important from the elders, the people who, who did activism before, those who have knowledge and experience, trying to open new visions and new horizons for actions in the communities. Uh, I'm a musician and I do also uh, activism in uh, human rights and uh, we make coalitions in communities with artists and activists from visual art, on theatre, on music and on activism on human rights, other uh, cases and advocacy. And economy. It's really a big question and I believe that most of the activists when they got these questions they started asking and squeezing their minds what's going on and, 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 and how can we answer these questions once and for all. I think this is going to be like an always a problem as long as we take it as a problem. What is the perspective that we look at money determines our judgment. If we say that money is fundamental for, uh, for activism, so it's going to remain uh, a must to find and it's going to remain a problem in, in some of the countries where activists are being misunderstood in most of the time. Thank you very much. Ahmed, I'm very happy that you introduce yourself. Maybe you can do the same. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, she's a colleague of mine, a lawyer. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Tamar Gulciani. I'm a lawyer, um, and I'm a chairperson of the board of uh, International Society for Fair Elections and Dem Democracy. Um, yeah, I had also the impression that your mic is not really um, working. So, um, um, I come from Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, and I'm a lawyer and I'm a chairperson of the board at the uh, International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy, one of the uh, biggest NGOs uh, and the oldest NGOs in Georgia. Uh, I'll be uh, speaking about the uh, NGO funding and the problems we, we face and we will face in future. Uh, we all know that uh, in uh, non-profit uh, work, money should uh, never come first. But uh, in countries like, like Georgia, sometimes money comes first, and then we are we are figuring out what we are what we have to do with that money. Uh, Ninety percent of uh, NGO funding uh, funding is coming from the international donors in Georgia. Uh, that means that uh, we, uh, as, as I said yesterday. Um, uh, we are completely dis disconnected from, from the public in a sense that we, we don't receive any contribution, uh, contributions from our ordinary citizens or, uh, or, uh, the, local or the local business. And uh, uh, in coming years, uh, interna uh, international uh, uh, funding will be um, disappeared and then, then we will, uh, we will uh, uh, have to re re reinvent 
ourselves. Also, that international, uh, we are, of course, uh, my Georgian nonprofits are very um, grateful of uh, all the international organizations that are operating in Georgia, but we developed kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, aid dependent mentality and we just don't do anything uh, uh, for fundraising, etc. But there are also um, there are also other other threat, uh, other problems we we face. Uh, sometimes uh, government does not do anything. Uh, like uh, we don't have le uh, le uh, legally enabling environment. Uh, uh, the the government do uh, does support uh, the small business, but they don't do anything. Uh, uh, they of course they they don't fund non non profits and. Uh, it's still controversial to me. Uh, how how is it possible to get money from the government, from the state budget, and and maintain your independence? Of course, that's a very hard question. But uh, uh, what I mean when I say that the government does not support NGOs in Georgia, it means that there are there are several several um, uh, legal uh, legal impediments. For example, uh, NGOs are allowed to carry out um, auxiliary uh, economic activities. Um, uh, but uh, but that income is subject to the pro profit tax. But uh, uh, as a whole, only 12% of the uh, day income is coming from the auxiliary economic activities. Uh, and the second impediment is uh, uh, on the volunteerism uh, uh, in general in Georgia. Uh, uh, when, uh, when reimbursement of uh, work-related expenses to uh, uh, volunteers is uh, treat treated as an income and it's, of course, subject to the uh, tax. Also, uh, the, there are problems with private philanthropy. Uh, as a rule, Georgian businesses and companies uh, do not uh, finance uh, uh, non-profits. Uh, although there are some incentives, uh, such as uh, income, income tax deduction provision, in the Georgian tax code, uh, uh, they, are, they are not eager to help nonprofits. And also, individual donations is not regulated that well, and that's why, the, the, that's why we, as a rule, we don't receive any funding from them. And the last uh, problem we face is uh, the government itself, uh, again, uh, which uh, just recently started to fund NGOs, but we don't know uh, what, what are, these, uh, uh, what are the uh, selection criteria they are using. Uh, and um, mm, of course, uh, of course uh, that's not a participatory process at, at all. And you know quite well, you, you all know that when you when you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So uh, that means that it, it means that uh, the, whenever a government uh, go, go funds uh, uh, specific NGOs, uh, of course uh, they are not watchdogs. They are they are just sometimes they are affiliated. Uh, um, they were affiliated with the with the um, uh, political party in power. Uh, of course that 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 somehow is uh, uh, is a problem for other uh, non-partisan uh, uh, NGOs. Um, uh, and uh, and the last, uh, my last point will, will be the recent, um, about the uh, uh, recent uh, um, uh, research that was conducted by the Chatham House and also there, there are several uh, uh, resources available, uh, for example, the NGO Sustainability Index uh, developed by the uh, USAID. Uh, now, oh, both uh, both of these uh, well, conclusions uh, conclusions are saying that uh, in countries like Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, uh, uh, NGOs are sometimes quite powerful. They have funding. They, they do have funding in Georgia, uh, uh, but uh, and they are influential. They uh, they make some difference in the country. Uh, they uh, they influence the uh, um, uh, the government official uh, government officials, etc. But uh, they form a, a sort of uh, angiocracy, so-called angiocracy. They are powerful enough, but uh, they uh, uh, they they are not held accountable by the general public because they don't have to raise money from the public. They don't have to do well, fundraising work because they are already uh, they are already receiving uh, that funding from the international donors. So. It, uh, 
yeah, the, uh, that's very hard, uh, hard, hard question, of course. Um, uh, on one hand, we, we do need that uh, uh, international support, but uh, on, the other hand, uh, on the other hand, we developed that aid-dependent mentality and we don't know how to, how to do our work uh, anymore. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your insights. Um, I will turn to the third speaker, activist. May I also kindly ask you to introduce yourself and sure. Is it share okay? your experience with us? Okay, uh, hi again, I'm Alexandra from Belgrade, Center for Cultural Decontamination. Uh, actually, this panel uh, uh, promises a lot, I mean, with the questions and answers, but uh, coming from an institution and a country that went through uh, really an intense period of uh, phases of activism and relations to, to before and after the changes and what the changes were and what were they ever happened and so far. Uh, I think maybe it's interesting to, to talk about our experience as a, a center that contains culture in its title and how this culture as a field became uh, in a way a sanctuary for all the activism that can't find support in other way or exposure or public visibility. So in a way, uh, with our game a project delegated public space we wanted to say that the big chunk of responsibility that we expected that the public uh, sector will finally take over after the changes were again delegated to civil society in Serbia but not the same uh, support and potential for uh, existence and, and maintaining all the uh, intensive activity that there are there so we have the situation that again some punctums uh, like 20 or 15 years ago, uh, center is among them, are burdened with the whole uh, responsibility towards uh, dozens and hundreds of organizations and individuals from civil society that uh, are not able to get funds or support to exist uh, or have space that's a luxury. So in a way we are one of several uh, remained public spaces, but to, not only as a pure venue. We, I will take an example. Uh, we were, we, we are constantly approached by initiatives and collectives and individuals, because we uh, have a certain context pretext that we invest there. So they're uh, they're getting some strength from uh, this past uh, reputation. Uh, but not only that, we have this so-called phone book and that's also a kind of capital that uh, uh, experience and, and a symbolic position gives to you after uh, this uh, kind of experience and uh, that's how we are trying to, to get to, to, to stretch this uh, uh, strength and uh, left uh, power uh, to, uh, to, to sustain uh, civil society gathered around several points and we are one of them. Uh, it's very hard. We can't uh, actually count on uh, public support. It's always uh, symbolic and uh, a few years ago we started with questioning how this uh, budget line uh, that is predicted for uh, civil society is actually constructed and it's funny to see how church and football supporters get uh, enormous kind of support and civil society lives on really minimal uh, public uh, support. So uh, all other uh, international uh, funds and uh, supporters uh, have to be uh, considered in any kind of uh, activity and uh, with talked about ACTA and this action today, we really supported this initiative from Belgrade. There are several initiatives really involved in it. But if we, for example, take this activism in new media, we come to the situation that we are approached by some students that they want to make this public discussion about ACTA and want to uh, want Belgrade uh, public to join this. We can give them 
for such a flexible reaction, there has to be a space, uh, center, infrastructure, and some uh, team that will help uh, put that on the public map uh, uh, and enable it to communicate with wider audience. That's how we, uh, for example, uh, try to uh, contribute to this wide action, but uh, at the same time we were struggling to maintain the center to exist at all. And for such a flexible reaction you have to have some kind of uh, support that will uh, 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 enable a variety of activity that you can't predict in project uh, management and application. It's a very wide field of uh, action, so that kinds of knots of civil society should somehow think uh, and have uh, understanding of their supporters and uh, foundations for such an activity. In Serbia, I think that's crucial for future functioning of civil society and we as a cultural center, I'm sorry, uh, we also can mask uh, various activity now uh, under cultural uh, production, but uh, in a way that's a very dangerous game because culturalization also uh, is a threat that you will amortize political requests if you just uh, translate it in the field of culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all three of our um, first speakers. Um, according to the script, you may leave, you have done your job, but please be my guest and um, join us here at the table. Um, let's change the perspective now. We have had uh, three speakers who shared uh, their experience with us, the potentials, the limits with respect to activism and funding, and related stories and related concerns as well. So I would like to pro uh, proceed with uh, Kirsten, and I would like to ask Kirsten um, whether you do share the concerns and how do you see your how do you see your um, the, your role actually in the whole is very complex situation? But before that, I will very briefly introduce you. Actually, if I may say this, um, Kirsten is from the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Normally, we had uh, here at our table today Barbara Unmusig, and she couldn't make it. Um, Kirsten was so great to jump in and um, continue the conversation with us. Um, let me briefly say that Kirsten is responsible at the Heinrich Böll Foundation for um, some regions and these regions are Africa, which is a very big continent actually and I'm very... <laughs> so, and the Middle East. And um, she had opportunities in the past to go there also. Uh, she lived there at these places and she lived and studied there and uh, made also some research. And um, yeah, Kirsten, tell us what, how do you see the situation from the Heinrich Böll Foundation perspective and from your past experience as well? Thank you, Jungus. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm quite grateful that I could jump in for Barbara on a, on a short notice though, because I think I've, I've really caught up on some of the subjects. I mean, if you asked me two, da two days ago, I think three days ago, what was crowdfunding, total blank. Many of the subjects you're discussing within these days are quite new to me, but what I can provide for this discussion is I was a donor. I'm, I'm still a donor, or I'm at least responsible for quite a lot of money. The Heinrich Böll Foundation spends every year uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's my job now, but I was also working in the Middle East. I was opening uh, and steering the office of the Böll Foundation in Palestine, um, responsible for several countries of the Middle East and then later on in Lebanon. So I first experienced with people like you, working activists and NGOs on the ground, and also from the pers perspective of, uh, you know, administering larger programs in the foundation. So, concerning the questions uh, for the panel, I, I want to sort of open up a triangle. Uh, starting from this question, can the individual activists, you know, like-minded people getting together on specific issues or cultural activists who say, hey, we have to do something with the demonstration, we want to bring songs and so on, 
um, can they access funding if they're not NGOs, institutionalized bodies of civil society? So I want to open up a triangle very briefly. First, talk about the problems, then talk about the options, and then talk about the question, how much does money really count, which Ahmed, I think, highlighted brilliantly in his intervention. So the problem is, can you access funding with donors like us if you're an individual activist or a group of activists? Hardly. With traditional donors, very difficult. Um, and I think there are several reasons, and I want to um, pinpoint some. One is, I think most traditional donors working internationally are probably let me be very provocative intellectually, a little bit lazy when it comes to the questions who are really the agents of change in the societies we want to work with. Is it, is it really that the institutionalized bodies of civil society, such as NGOs working for 10, 20 years on, on human rights, um, gender equality, etc., are these going to bring about change like we've seen in Tunisia, in Egypt, other places? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm also quite blank on Eastern Europe. Um, I think, no, in most, in, to my, in my experience, they're, they're, they have a great importance, um, but mobilization, etc., comes from also many other actors who are overseen. And then we have administrative hurdles. Um, many of us donors, for instance, Heinrich Böll Foundation, as an example, we get most of our money internationally through development corporations. So it's governmental funds, which which come with the whole package of guidelines, administrative guidelines. We need partners who can administer finances, who are accountable, who bring receipts, etc. So many of the activists, and especially cultural activists, are not really used to do that. So what, what can we do? Um, I think one of the, one of the gaps um, that, that donors are facing are that uh, sometimes it appears in some of the countries I've experienced it, it, it appears as if there's two different worlds apart. The traditional NGOs, societies and the young activists who, who use different tools etc. I think we have to discuss better how to connect these two worlds. Um, I'm talking for instance I'm just back from Abuja in, in Nigeria. If you, look, if you talk to the, to the young people who were in Occupy Nigeria and if you talk to the NGO people, wow, it's really worlds apart and it's very rare that these people meet in one room and discuss an issue like women in politics. We just had, had that and it was thrilling. Um, one of the little remarks I wanted to make in this context is one of the big problems that, that come with donor money for activists is that donors love to put labels. They put the Heinrich Böll Foundation label, the European Union label, etc. So in many cases, this discredits the work of some forms of activism. And I think activists have to be very careful uh, what label to accept, etc. But I think unless donors become more flexible on these issues, there's nothing to be done. So a long speech cutting short, what I really want to say is that unless I think development cooperation and its agents around the world start to believe in activism and new modes of mobilizations for change, um, their priorities will not change. They will go on the same tracks of funding the institutionalized uh, NGOs and, and no big changes. They have to do much more work in order to, to really fund activism. They have to be much more flexible. They have to be sometimes half clandestine. I mean, not put big labels, not say we do lots of public relations on our corporations. And I think they have to focus on cultural uh, activities. Culture is tremendously underfunded. And if you allow, um, I stop here. Thank you very much, Robert. The second speaker is um, Robert Durhage. Um, he studied engineering and media philosophy at the Free University of Berlin. And since 2009, he's um, responsible for online communication. He's an online communication manager at the Oxfam and uh, an independent aid and development organization. He's co-founder and administrator of wikisocialbar.de, co-organizer of the conference for online campaigns such as ReCampaign. Um, Robert, so you have heard a lot of speakers 
the four speakers until now, you are on this on the side of the donors, I would say, correct? Well, or is that already a question who you should address? So let me let's keep that as a first question. Um, my question to you would be also. Um, I have been told that you're a good observer of the newest trends. So could you maybe also tell us more or share your insights? So where are the, what are the trends today in your work and generally, and what are your observations on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm working for Oxfam at the internet desk and in the web team, uh, a little a lower position there, and um, try to, co to coordinate the communication online. Uh, but also advise uh, Oxfam on, on new trends and new developments uh, that are happening on the digital landscape. And uh, so it's one of my job to, to look at all the platforms and look at uh, crowdfunding and what op opportunities are there. And um, so, but uh, what I heard from all the activists here that there is a struggle to, to raise funds and to stay independent as well. And uh, I, I went around in, the, in my organization and talked to my colleagues um, what, what are the best practices to do this. And um, they, they come up with a lot of uh, good things um, that I didn't know before. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is uh, that you have to spread the risk. Um, when you want to stay independent, you have to spread the risk um, of uh, becoming dependent. Uh, so that means that you should never allow anyone to sponsor more than one third of your costs. Um, spread it over more uh, donors and on the long, um, in long-term partnerships uh, try to get it down to one, one tenth uh, of a part uh, that some donor gets uh, puts in as a sponsor. So um, Oxfam has a quite uh, uh, strict rule on this uh, that uh, never um, partner with one uh, organization only. And then we uh, focus on medium-sized businesses and foundations because they're really easier, uh, much more easier to evaluate them um, on the moral side if they, if they are okay to work with. And um, then try to always use different ways to fundraise, um, not uh, only rely on sponsorship or only rely on donations, but also spread the risk here. Uh, so this is one big uh, uh, best practice on, on the administrative or organizational challenge to stay independent. And then the second one is um, the moral ch challenges and uh, the risk for your um, reputation as an organization. So Oxfam has a good rep rep reputation for fighting poverty um, globally in 99 countries. And of course, when you partner with someone, you have to evaluate how the company or the foundation does their business. And you have to look at their code of ethics, their code of conduct, their CSR reports, their fair trade policy, their labor standards, and their, uh, also in their supply chain, uh, chain and uh, the scandals they are involved in in the um, past. And um, uh, you have to really research them, and if they if they are a bigger organization or a bigger company, um, it's it's sometimes really hard to do. So there are agents uh, agencies right there out there that could, you can ask to to research for you for you to uh, in all these points, and um, it's roughly about ten thousand dollars you have to put in there for a good uh, evaluation of a uh, company. So it's it's not really um, uh, easy to do. And it only uh, works with uh, um, when there's a lot of money involved. And uh, then, of course, you have you, uh, you have to evaluate the project you want to do with them in this partnership. And um, can and if the project can really achieve measurable results and promise some real positive impact for the people we want to help. And this is basically the the, the most important thing that um, uh, in, in in the last step you have to agree on a contract and it, there has to be a really good contract there um, that is fair for the people we want to help and um, I think that is uh, the, the key point of partner with any uh, person or foundation out there and um, so uh, then the second question was on the trends and what, what is happening there um, I don't want to speak about the financial crisis and how this was um, uh, related to, to a step up that NGOs have to do in, in the way they fundraise and um, 
and and try to get connect to the to the governments and um, do some services the governments would do before uh, that we have to do now for ourselves. Um, and uh, but I want to say that what I see is the donors organize themselves more with dig in digital ways. They come together, especially major donors, um, forming groups, forming own foundations, and um, getting themselves more organized. And um, this is on one hand a good thing. You don't have to ask a lot of people, they are, they are organized, but then it's uh, a bad thing because they, they uh, have higher demands uh, on what, uh, what, you do, do, what you do with money and how you should spend the money. And then on the, pro, on the crowdfunding um, question, um, there we see that this is a, quite a big hype right now, and it's, all, it's, it's kind of quite difficult to fundraise there as an NGO. Um, so you see a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter, which is really, really huge, um, which has uh, $500 million raised for startups, and they don't allow charity projects there. And they don't, don't allow projects um, where you can fund for uh, supporting my lifestyle as an, as an activist. Um, so it's, it's really business focused and you can't uh, uh, go there as an activist. And then you have um, another big crowdfunding platform that is called Kiva. And Kiva is all about microfinancing. So it's all about loans and it's not really a gift or a, a sponsor you, you get there, but it's a loan and you have to really make sure that it helps you to, to achieve your goals and uh, that you can manage to give it back also. And um, Kiva especially is, is an uh, interesting uh, kind of organization. They raise money, micro donations from, from private people, um, give, them to, give this money to microfinancing institutes um, with interest rates, of course. They, they're financing with uh, themselves through interest rates. They give to uh, microfinance institutions and they put on another interest rate to give it to the people they need. So um, uh, the first donor gives the money with zero interest to Kiva and then uh, this, the last person in the chain uh, has to pay everything. Uh, so I don't know if this is really the thing we want to do. Also, there is a big change happening with this in the public opinion that it is more, uh, that it is maybe better to um, uh, finance something with a loan and not with a gift or a donation. And uh, this is a trend um, right now. So, um, yeah, and then the last trend we see right now is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. That is happening a lot and that is uh, quite popular. And this is um, that you ask other people to fundraise for you. So, and um, there you see personal events and challenges uh, that uh, your friends um, uh, organize a dinner and ask their friends for a donation or that um, uh, you, there's a lot of shopping going on online where you can shop secondhand clothes and uh, make a donation and also um, uh, there, uh, yeah, and I think though, I will leave, leave it with this. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer is one one major uh, trend right now. Thank you very much, Robert. <clears throat> um, I would like to proceed to our last speaker. Um, Vera Franz had. Um, the Information Policy and Intellectual Property Reform Initiatives at the Open Society Information Program. She has also been deeply involved in the launch and development of the Global Access to Knowledge uh, Movement, A2K, and is also working to strengthen civil society advocating um, for the protection of human rights uh, online. Um, I think it's, very also, it's also very important to highlight that she's a member of uh, the advisory board of Ariadne. I hope uh, you will say also something about that. It's, the, it's a European network of human rights uh, funders. Um, Vera, so you have the privilege to have heard everyone here speaking and um, it would be great if you would just pick up some uh, guiding questions, but I would be very happy if you would also already interconnect with what have been said now. Yes. Um, thank you and also thanks to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for the invitation to speak here. Well. Um, I just want to build on what my colleague from the Heinrich Böll Foundation said in terms of that established foundations like Heinrich Böll, but also 
the Open Society Foundations, I think we're really bad at working with non-institutionalized actors. And uh, yet we fully recognize that that's actually where sometimes, um, you know, in recent times, the most progressive change is coming from. And so we internally at the Open Society Foundations have a lot of conversations about that. We're like, well, are we funding, you know, actually in the wrong places? Uh, established older institutions when in fact the change is coming from somewhere else and unfortunately till this day we haven't really found a, a sort of innovative good way to work with non-institutionalized actors so I put this more as a challenge to you all if you if you have thoughts if you have ideas I think we'd be really really keen on on hearing those and debating those because we're aware that we need to change and we're just a bit you know um, held capture by our, our own institutions and institutional culture, I think. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about um, how uh, movements or civil society sectors w move from being a volunteer-driven uh, sector to a professional sector, professional in the sense that they're getting paid to be activists, right? And um, the sector I work in is the so-called digital rights sector, internet freedom sector, or here in Germany, Netz politics sector. And uh, Germany is a good example because um, I think the digital rights field here is, um, has enormously strong volunteer structures um, that advocated for ACTA, but also many other um, sort of important issues before. But I think um, there is a recognition that there is a limit to volunteer-driven work. And I think this goes a little bit back to what was said in the first session today in terms of what we need in um, civil society, in especially the rights field as well, is continuity. And we need not to just be defensive, but de um, de develop positive agendas, be proactive. So that came for me out very strongly of the first session. Now, in order to do that, can you operate with a volunteer-driven structure, right? And I believe not. I think you need uh, actually people whose job it is to develop those new visions. So I've spent a lot of time the past five years trying to see how can uh, established foundations like us move some of these sectors from volunteer-driven to actual sort of um, institutions, if you want. Um, and I must say, I was lucky because um, up to a certain amount of money, I have, a li uh, I have relative freedom to basically go out, find people, and say, um, this is a very good person, um, this person has a vision, this person is a great activist. Um, I hope you don't mind mentioning you. Jeremy Zimmerman here was one example where I said, I think you know, this is a person uh, we should just invest in, even though he did have no institution and no structure. And so I could do that um, as long as I didn't, you know, kept the amount of money we were given to a certain limit. Um, so that was great. That worked, you know, for some time. And then, um, you know, at some point, Jeremy's like, you know, it's a lot. I'm burning out. I mean, how much can you do, you know, in terms of fighting campaign after campaign with a relatively small operation? And then the question became, if such an institution like La Quarta to the Net, but it goes for any other similar organization, Digital Gesellschaft, would want you know, to have more resources, then a foundation like us has a lot of requirements in terms of, do you have a board, do you have a governance structure, et cetera, et cetera. So that spirit, that spontaneous spirit, you know, is threatened to being sort of killed. And so that's a little bit uh, where I'm currently um, sort of very actively thinking about how one can do that. And it's not always easy, but um, at the same time, I think we need to professionalize these structures. And maybe just one other thing in terms of dependence, independence of the civil society sector. I think it also depends a lot on the number of funders in the field, you know. So I think there are fields where there is a lot of variety of people active in a certain field. So I feel that goes back to your point. The more funders you have, the more independent you can feel because you can drop, you know, money from one source because you have nine other sources. I think the reality for most NGOs and civil society sectors is it's probably not that way. <laughs> so, for example, again, to 
take the example that I know best, the uh, digital rights or net's politic. Unfortunately, and again, Europe is the, is the world I know best or the region I know best. It's currently really European citizens supporting this activism and um, the Open Society Foundations is the one institutional funder that supports this activism through core funding in all of Europe, right? And that's a very unhealthy situation again and makes, again, I think, a whole sector overly dependent on, on sort of one institution. Thank you very much, Vera, for this very critical assessment. Oh. Ah, that's not fair. Oh, my God. I think we have to hurry up here because... Um, um, well, Vera, I, m my idea was to have a first very cozy round, and then I would jump in with some very critical questions. But I think you made a great job. You anticipated, and you already started the first critical, I mean, of course, everyone has made some critical assessments, but my point is um, you already have emerged some too little controversy, apparently, or maybe I have two reactions here, P two people who would like to react on what you have said, and after that, I would like to continue with the next questions. Go ahead. Very short, please. Very short, all day long, very short. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's in all conferences. Sorry. Vera, as much as we agree on, on some of the issue, I've, I just wanted to, to highlight a bit on the problematics of institutionalizing uh, activism. Because, I've, I mean, in my, in my practice over years, I, I could also see how donor policy um, towards institutionalizing sometimes, and no offense taken, because there's many good examples why we need to institutionalize, but sometimes we have killed activism by being reactive on a certain development, not recognizing that activism is incredibly dynamic and changes formats, people, uh, networking all the time, um, and then just sort of bring money in and spoil some of the aspects of dynamism. Um, so I, I think we have to be much more analytical to the layers in between. When I, I left out in my intervention what I thought was options uh, of funding, even though we, are, we have this institutional uh, restrictions, administratively, guideline-wise, etc. I think we can sometimes, uh, we can network between the two worlds apart. We work with the NGOs. If we get to know the activists, individuals, let, let's see where you know, they can join forces. I mean, there is a space given in Belgrade, and you, you were saying many of the people come to you and make use of your being established already. I think that's extremely useful to facilitate that. A uh, very concrete example where I think is the layer in between. I remember somebody telling me, I wasn't present in Syria, but in the beginning of the revolution, there was a, there was a beautiful activity. Um, some young people s met in a secret place, presumably secret, and started to write slogans, very tiny little slogans, um, on ping pong balls, what you played table tennis with, thousands of them. I mean, not a few people, it probably took some more people. Then they went up on the mountain and they released the ping pong balls and they just went down on the city and they ran away. Um, now, Apparently, in Damascus, the, the government people live close to the mountain. So the ping pong balls with all these protests <laughs> fell on them and into their gardens and houses and their children found it and started reading to their parents and so on. Now, this is activism. It doesn't need institutionalization. It's the opposite, you know. Uh, what needed help was to document this because as we stand now, we're not seeing anymore the peaceful, uh, innovative, brilliant, <coughs> courageous activity still existing in this revolution. I still call it a revolution. Um, there are so many friends of ours who lost their life, who are, who are arrested, etc., because they are still practicing peaceful protest, but it's not documented enough. And we need these pictures. So give equipment, help uh, documentary filmers to go when they're on the ground because the others can't come in and so on. That's something very important to be funded and there we have to find flexible ways. But these people at the moment, they don't need to be institutionalized. They don't have to form an NGO for this revolution. That's, that's what, what I find critical, sorry. Can I just thank you? Me. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I, I prepared a dossier here, and 
I am serious, and it says totally the opposite of the of some of the ideas Go that ahead. are going on here. Here, I have a personal recognition from the government of Yemen that I am an artist activist, and I have a band three meters away. I think this is one of the most important things for activists is to put things on the ground, and everybody should know, because this is the thing that we try to change the society. So it's about information, it's about knowledge. All parties, everybody involved should know, and then it, it's up to them. This is the release that we got, the first thing that we got. So we stay independent. The government knows what we are doing. The, uh, the fundraising, it's like if you get uh, this kind of an official paper, Nobody is going to question at all uh, your means from the inside why you are receiving money from uh, sponsor or supporter. One of the most important things for activists also is to degrade the ideas before an action. It's like, do we know Maslow's uh, pyramid for the basic human needs? We all know that there are some things that we really need, and activists is just a human. If we provide these things for ourselves, if we <coughs> recognize that these things are for granted for us, we are going to get these things, then an action is, is very easy by networking. Uh, in Yemen, we uh, occupied the... Noah is here and the other activists too. In Yemen, we occupied the National Museum in Fedula Music to have uh, m uh, the International Day of Music. And actually, we didn't have any fund for that in 2012. Uh, this is the invitation that we created from normal paper. paper. We printed, we had a, a printer. And we printed just papers and cutting them, having the stamp here. And here in Arabic, you can read. Uh, it's like creative designing. This is activism. Uh, it's, it's related to art. We have to improvise in most of the times. We have to f fulfill the needs that we want to do. And uh, most recently, we have been the group, this three meters away, the name of the band, have been in Abyan. And uh, in each activity, we inform the government in a letter, an official letter, stamped from the, from the group, from the band. We are active on stage five people, six people. And uh, it's being built through the uh, artist scam that we are doing, bringing friends and artists from around the world and meeting here and there, trying to make a background, trying to make a home for artists and activists. And we went to this village visiting in Peace and Love Tour in, 2000, in September, Peace and Peace Day, having Peace Cup in, in that village. And after the event, you know, the evaluation comes from the artists from within, from themselves. And in the village, they, the people themselves, uh, give us these uh, appreciation certificates that these activists came. I think this is really important. This matters because we are trying to implement some changes in, in societies where people are touched by the things we say. People are touched by the things they, they see in our actions. So it's like degrading the needs that we have in order to get to the maximum power of activism. This is one of the things. And uh, I think one of the most important things for artists and activists is to evaluate and re-evaluate themselves because most of the times, they are not part of any educational institution, and they are active on the field, like the Finnish education, and they are active on the field. So each and every action that happens, we need to sit down and evaluate where are we going? Are we going better for ourselves in the, in the first place? And then the community. We have to recognize that if we are standing in front of the camera or having a microphone to speak to the, to the public, we have to make evaluations on ourselves each and every time. I'm sorry, I have a lot of points. We have also a video clip that we... These actions may, started may for... Me. Uh, please. You uh. may you may speak as much as you want, but... <laughs> I, I don't want to be unfair to you. I think I'm treated unfair here because I've been told that my panel is now shorted with 15 minutes because this is going to be very critical. But I don't want, no, I can't understand because we really have to shorten. That's why. Otherwise, I would have given you we'll really two more minutes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, um, Vera, would you uh, mind if I would continue? And I would love to give the audience 
uh, the word and I would love to collect uh, three questions. Please be very short, very pointed, so that we have enough time to discuss them here on the panel. Do we have a mic um, to pass it up front first and then I'll pass it back? Do this, okay? Does it work? Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Dayan. I come from Belgrade. Also, uh, I have to say the first rule of activism is supposed to be no money, no problem. So <laughs> when you don't have money, your activism comes from your heart. The second thing is I just want to follow this story about uh, donors. I come from <coughs> the region that recently had wars during the 90s. And I have to say that the donors in the Balkans, in Western Balkans, former Yugoslavia, share the same guilt because of the situation that was happening during the 90s and that is happening even right now as the citizens of all those countries. Recently, I have one radio show that's been broadcasted in 10 different websites in four different countries that used to be one before the 1991. And uh, I tried to find some donors just to cover the cost of cameramen because I wanted to do a TV episodes. And they told me that I don't have, uh, this is how they said, uh, like some kind of portfolio for donors. So all the doors were closed for me. This is the problem that we are speaking right now. Okay, I don't want to <laughs> do any more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'm Kasia from Panopticon Foundation Poland. For the last three years, I've been trying to run um, an NGO that started as a non-profit. I mean, obviously, it's still non-profit, but we started as a no-money activism only, and we moved towards something more institutionalized. And I want to bring here a slightly different um, issue, which is what we discussed in, in, in previous panels, that there is a point when activism has to become constructive and has to become proactive. And this is where we really need organization and institutions right and in digital digital rights uh, area it's extremely difficult to build this organization without serious funding because what we need we need people who will confront governments and big corporations on extremely technical very sophisticated issues yeah we can bring acta internet blocking data protection whatever you like this is not something that people without proper education without proper proper money to 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 get professional in this area will will cover and that's a huge challenge because at the same time these people cannot take money from the government and from their corporations so we are left either with donors like like yourselves and here i mean i'm extremely grateful that you are still in this business and you are patient enough to to help us but we definitely need to find uh, the way to mobilize maybe people to give money but that's an education channel challenge at least in poland people like ordinary internet users they will never imagine how much money is needed for that kind of activity and that we really need that money because they think of us as wealthy lawyers or I don't know what because you know that's kind of status that people fighting for these complicated issues have in society uh, yeah I, I want to speak about uh, uh, I forgot what I want to say but anyways uh, I'll get back to that. hi Sorry to put pressure on you. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to uh, highlight the argument that we've been having in uh, in our country regarding funding. We've, there's always the, some stigma to the NGOs and the groups that uh, get funding, especially that this is also uh, a string or a card that the governments usually play when they want to uh, stigmatize uh, some groups. And uh, sometimes it's the funders' fault sometimes it's the NGO's fault for not delivering what they're supposed to deliver and also for not being accountable, for not giving, uh, for not having a system of uh, uh, check and balances against the money that they're, ge they're getting. And this is how they're also uh, affecting uh, the reputation of other NGOs that get funding as well. So I was wondering if uh, how y your comments as, uh, as donors on, on this. 
Were there some other comment? Okay, yeah. this is the last comment, please. Um, yeah, um, hello, I'm Minidam from Albania. Uh, I would rather make a comment than a question. I thank you, thanks all the panel for all the um, contributions they gave, and I understand the situation of Georgia. I understand a lot of the donors. I have worked with the um, Albanian Vodafone Foundation, so as a donor, I am working in an NGO. I have done a lot of things in an NGO, so um, I think. And I would say that, at least in the Albanian context, activism comes with uh, responsibility. The moment I present myself and as, as an LGBTIQ activist, I am responsible for what I'm saying, because what am I active for, or what am I doing my activism for, for all the Albanian LGBTIQ uh, members, or for the LGBTIQ members of the world. Also, as donation or money I take for, for my activism or for my NGO, of course, come with a responsibility as well. But what you see in reality and real life in Albania is that few people know this and has taken activism as like a full-time job. That means you don't have like time to get like um, food and all of these things for yourself and donation becomes a full-time job as well. So it needs to be dialogue within this too. And activism, I don't think it needs to be funded as in being an activist, but of course we need donors and donors need maybe to be a little bit more smart, at least in the Albanian case, to whom are they donating to and what is this money changing? Thank you. Last but only, no? Okay, then. Okay. Oh, I thought Matthias was going to Matthias has um, given up the space. I'll give it to Jake, okay, and then we can have a closing round on the panel. So I actually have a question um, for the Yemenis gentleman. Um, knowing that my country, I, I'm an American by birth, knowing that my country kills people with flying robots in your country, um, even Americans in your country, in fact, I wonder, do you think that there are limits to your art and how you feel that certificate actually protects you? That is, does the drone recognize that? And I, I don't mean that as a joke. I really mean what, what, what kind of chilling effect on your speech exists as a result of those targeted killing programs, knowing that you're in Yemen, for example? Okay, we have had four or five um, very compelling comments and um, questions. I think there was a there was one direct question. I would love you. Well, one minute, of course. Only one minute. <laughs> okay. uh, regarding that, I think. Regarding that, I think it's a responsibility on artists and activists at the first place to. Uh, stand against violations against human rights. This is one of the most important things. And the good news is that recently, just two days ago, I was in Ethiopia and we volunteered with the, the national movement to officially deliver the file to La Hague uh, court against some of the violations against human rights since 2007 to 2011 in the south, in, in Yemen. And uh, this is part of what we do. Activism is a full-time job. We call it what we, whatever we call it, but we call it like sometimes it's living the, the case that we are defending, you know? It's affecting us. It's, it's not fair. Yes, a lot of drowns and killed a lot of people, but it doesn't mean that we have to stop. It doesn't mean that we have to uh, change the trend. It, it means that we have to, mobil to go mobilize more and make these people part of the circle. These people who are attacking, these people who are attacking uh, protesters and so on. We go to talk to these people rationally and make them part of the solution, make them part of the problem. They, they recognize that they should do something. It's, there are a lot of things uh, that to consider when you meet an official or a politician that you can make him turn in, in a certain alternative way, not against the rules, but trying to reason troubleshooting with politicians because we face this every day. There are rules and politicians act uh, based on that rules. But what is troubleshooting? If we can get a way where we reason about our actions and their actions, reactions to, to us, we can do what we want. And the final judge between activists in his work, between uh, politicians in their policies, is the secrecy, as I believe, the secrecy of the text. If we analyze and understand and understand fully the text of the idea, if we write down that 
text of an idea and analyze it well, this is killing. Everybody knows killing is wrong. This is activism. Everybody knows act, act and action. Then uh, we recognize it if it's good for the society, if it's good for the individual. It's like so many uh, scopes that activists work. And there is risk, of course, that we, we are being uh, exposed to. And now, uh, my statement also now about a lot of things, you know, can, can complicate things. But we keep going, keep going, you know? I by myself have a lot of questions, thank you very much. But I would love to give other panelists the opportunity to react on what has been said in the audience. Fira, you also will have to. Yeah, I would like to respond to the other questions um, about fundraising and activism. And I want to make the case that fundraising is a form of activism as well, because you can um, grow your your activism and can scale your activism and can help to, to improve your um, achievements. Uh, so, um, I know that fundraisers are really, sometimes really strange people to, to partner with, but they are some, uh, sometimes really, really useful. And as an activist, um, it, it does become a an, full-time job to fundraise if you're, if you're getting into it. And um, so partner up at least with one fundraiser, really good fundraiser, uh, so you can focus on your activism. And um, when you don't want to get institutionalized uh, in, in some kind of way of, or another, at least partner up with a really good fundraiser. And um, what fundraisers do is, is quite amazing sometimes. They, um, uh, they on, from one dollar, they make four dollars. And so they're, they, they're really, really good in what they're doing. It's not that they fundraise two percent more or, or six percent more. No, they fundraise 400 percent more or sometimes 1,000 percent more. So they're really, really good in what they're doing. And partner with them is, is a really great thing to do, I would say. And um, I think activists have to become more open to partner with fundraisers. Wow. Um, these are very clear words. Um, go ahead. I think I would love to give an activist the opportunity to react on that. I'll be very, very short. Uh, just to reply, uh, I come from this culture of enthusiasm of former Yugoslavia and alternative culture in the 90s. I believe in this, no money, no worries. But uh, we are now, I think, in a phase that we have to fight for the space for activism as such. Very essential battles are going on, whether it, we are talking about physical space or internet, because internet is real. <laughs> so I think we uh, th those are very serious battles, and we have to rethink the activism uh, so we can prepare uh, and somehow emancipate this basic infrastructure for future emancipatory processes. So I think it's th therefore uh, very crucial now to get uh, understanding from people who can uh, establish this kind of front. I think, um, so I worked for two years actually in Vukovar, so former Yugoslavia, also with a local youth center, and I believe really these spaces you create are tremendously important. Um, and, and this they are almost a bridge between, you know, um, sort of the informal world and the formal institutionalized world. Um, I think we need to close. So just maybe very briefly, I, I want to last thing further confuse the definition of activism i consider myself to be an activist even though i work for a foundation but uh, i i you know i'm using my skills the tools i have to produce change that's how i see myself and um it it, it um sort of i consider myself lucky because i'm working for a non-governmental foundation i'm working for an and and there i have more flexibility and also for a foundation that is willing to take more risks and so in my work i just try i think every person working for a foundation has the responsibility to as much as possible create protected spaces to sort of fund exactly you know the more informal parts and and sort of push away the bureaucracy as much as we can from at least small pockets of sort of freedom within a foundation where you can fund in a more sort of informal and and creative constructive way i was uh I'm sorry. I was just going to say that um, sometimes we we are not underfunded. We do have funding, but uh, we we feel responsible and accountable to the 
organizations that are giving us money. And um, if we close that circle between uh, us and uh, the international donors, uh, new civil voices won't be born soon. So that, that was my point, that we should uh, rethink the mechanisms of accountability um, among the NGOs. Uh, and that's the most important thing in my uh, case. Thank you. Maybe just two, two points. One on my little provocation. I just basically wanted to remind us, as we are sitting in this room, we're, we're talking about a specific um, form of activism that asks for sustainability, etc. And our colleague from Poland um, reminded us brilliantly. But I, I think the reality is, at least for the Global South, the majority of activism will never even get anywhere close to funding. It's about the lack of services that people get activated in the villages, uh, you know, where there's no school, preschool, da 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 da. So they get together, they go from house to house, they collect money, they ask a woman to take care of other children in a township, etc., without ever asking a donor organization or even coming close to a donor organization. Second point on the independence and how governments use um, the fact that NGOs get funded from international donors, yes, and I think there's also, that, that, once again, we need to discuss this more. Let's give an example, LGBTI rights in Sub-Saharan Africa, very problematic for a gay community in, let's say, Uganda to get funded and labeled with the funding because the government will use it to say it's un-African, you see the money is coming from the, we the West, the, the values, um, all this homophobia is connected to it. Um, US money in Palestine, also problematic, <laughs> as we saw, etc. There's so many examples. Um, so, yeah, as an NGO, um, discuss it from the beginning, whom to fundraise with. Origin of the country of the donor. Um, some donors ask for your registry. Uh, sh should you allow for it or not? All questions. Thank you very much, um, Kirsten. Uh, we are about to finish this, but I would love to use my privileges as moderator and uh, to make some concluding remarks, actually, with respect to this panel and session. Well, let me very quickly start by myself. Um, I didn't introduce myself, and I was a little irritated by the fact that I'm in, I was asked for this panel because I've been a, um, an activist, an anti-racist activist for more than 15 years, and I haven't seen ever one one single cent for this for the activism I do and I would like to I would like to highlight that and I'm not saying I'm not reducing all the activism to this form of activism of course I respect the work of a lot of activists in various fields where money is needed but I think it's also very important to highlight that um, it's not all about money and that you have to have some commitment. And I think when I was hearing you, Ahmed, I was thinking that maybe there is a division line. And um, I have the feeling that as a person of color in Germany, I sometimes I had the impression that I didn't have the choice to be anti-racist or not. I didn't have the choice to use my knowledge to actually um, proceed to, to, to go forward with the anti-racist activism. So is there, does it make a difference in um, whether you are a victim of your, of, your, of your cause, actually? I think that's very important also to keep. And another uh, important issue I was thinking about when we were speaking here, I think no institu institutionalization is needed is one statement I would like to, to keep here. But at the same time, I think institutionalization is needed and may need it in some other forms and well we and I had also the impression that there is no escape to a capitalist art of 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 of, of uh, the capitalist mode of how money comes and goes and what happens with the money because it seems to be that all these things are in their interdependent last but not least money has been in the center of the session but 
of course, activism is not all about money. We didn't speak about state power, about state relations. So what happens, I mean, so what's the gain if you have money, but the state doesn't allow you to do any single step? So having said that, I would like to thank all the panelists here for, the, for their very critical assessment. I would like the audience. And uh, thank you very much for the Heinrich Quill Foundation also to make this possible. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Cengiz. I am sorry for being the bad cop of the day in terms of timekeeping oh, and everything, no, 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 but... Um, sorry, I, I didn't want to be very harsh. Oh, no, I didn't. That that was just part of the I'm show. just going to say I can be even more of, of a bad cop because um, we are now a little bit behind schedule, and um, I promise you to be even more of a mean bad cop for the sec last two sessions we have to make sure we get back on time track for the overall um, conference and finish up on time. We have a coffee break now, and I think we all need to take a deep breath and some refreshments, but I would ask you kindly to be back in here at 10 past 5 sharp, and we have two more really exciting sessions coming up, and... And at the end of that, we have free booze. So do stick around and enjoy the rest of the afternoon with us. Thanks. <laughs>